What's up, guys? So if you've been listening to the podcast or the YouTube, you probably heard our last lecture on anterior shoulder dislocations. Well, today we're going to be building on that topic, so if you happen to miss it, make sure and go back and listen. Last week we talked about how these patients will present, how the injury is most commonly sustained, how to do a good shoulder exam, what imaging studies to order, and finally we talked about how to reduce the shoulder without having to sedate the patient. However, there will be times when you are unable to reduce the shoulder without sedating the patient. Maybe because this procedure is too painful for them, or maybe because they're a really muscular individual and they're too tense to reduce the shoulder without sedation. So today we're going to talk about how to effectively, and more importantly, safely sedate the patient and reduce the shoulder in the emergency room. Now I want to stop for a moment before we get into procedural sedation. While procedural sedation can be done safely and effectively by physicians, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners, if you are unfamiliar with these medications commonly used, the complications that can arise and or do not have experience with managing an airway, then you should not be performing procedural sedation. If you find yourself under this category, that is okay. Remember, the first rule of medicine is do no harm. Simply approach your attending physician and tell them that you have a patient with an anterior shoulder dislocation who could either not tolerate the reduction procedure secondary to pain or was unsuccessful. It's important to know your own limitations and your attending physicians will respect you for that. Ask them if they can either manage the airway for you or perform the reduction while you assist with the procedure. However, before you perform or assist with the procedure, you will want to go over a couple things with the patient. The first thing you will want to do is to make sure you take a good past medical history of the patient to find out what medical problems they have. Important comorbidities to note are those in which increase the patient's susceptibility to the cardio and respiratory depressant effects of sedatives. For example, Ask them if they have any underlying respiratory or heart disease such as COPD, asthma, or do they snore a lot at night which could indicate sleep apnea. If they do have sleep apnea, is it bad enough that they have to wear a CPAP device? Ask them if they have any congestive heart failure, anemia requiring periodic blood transfusion, or did they just have a recent myocardial infarction? You will also want to ask them if they've ever been intubated before and been told they have a difficult airway. Ask your patients if they have any allergies to medications or a history of bad reactions to anesthesia in the past. In addition, we want to ask them when the last time they ate or drank anything so we can decrease the risk of aspiration. Make sure to narrow down the exact time they last had something to eat and drink, what it was, and how much it was. Now, the standard requirement from anesthesia recommends that you have nothing to eat or drink past midnight before your procedure, leaving you NPO for about six to eight hours. However, it's rare in the ED for patients that are requiring sedation to fulfill this historical fasting criteria for six to eight hours and studies show there's little evidence to support this approach. The American College of Emergency Physicians policy on procedural sedation is as follows. Recent food intake is not a contraindication for administering procedural sedation and analgesia, but should be considered in choosing the timing and target of sedation. So what does this mean? It means that if your patient just went to Burger King and ate two double cheeseburgers, a large fry, and a Coke before they came into the ED, you should probably wait at least two hours or more before doing procedural sedation, as long as the procedure is not emergently indicated. And you should also sedate the patient as lightly as possible. Now, I say at least two hours because according to one review, patients who fasted for two hours have the same gastric volume as those who fasted for longer periods. However, each person will be case specific and you might want to wait even longer in the poorly controlled diabetic patient when known gastroparesis on Reglam. Just remember, there's no great studies to recommend specific NPO times because no clear evidence proves that longer fasting times do reduce the risk of aspiration. So I think a reasonable approach is to wait at least two hours or longer in the patient who's just eaten a large amount of food and does not require an emergent procedure. Clinically significant aspiration during emergency part procedural sedations is very rare, but it is important to consider the risk and benefits before performing the procedure in every patient and take every precaution to reduce this risk as much as possible. Ultimately, you need to follow your institutional guidelines, and if they require all patients to be NPO for at least six hours, you must follow your institutional guidelines. So, how do we decide which patients will be high risk for procedural sedations in the ED? Well, the answer to that is there's no clear-cut guidelines. The American Society of Anesthesiologists, or ASA, scoring system is commonly used before patients undergo general anesthesia, but is not really applicable in the ED, so we're not going to get tied down about it talking about it in detail today. However, some emergency departments will not allow you to do procedural sedation in the ED if their classification score is too high. So once again, make sure to know your institutional guidelines and are practicing in accordance. 
However, there are many easy calculators online that can help you classify these patients, and I think it can only aid in your decision. However, instead of calculating the ASA class, or along with calculating the ASA classification, you need to determine the level of risk for an adverse outcome during procedure sedation, taking into account the patient's past medical history, their age, NPO status, urgency of the procedure, how deep they will need to be sedated, and the difficulty of securing their airway. So for example, let's say you have a 22-year-old male who will need a procedural sedation for an anterior shoulder dislocation. The last time they ate or drank anything was six hours ago. They have no medical problems, and you have determined the absence of a difficult airway if they are needed to be intubated. This patient represents the ideal candidate for a procedural sedation in the ED. However, let's say you have an 80-year-old female with a past medical history of COPD, 65 pack years of tobacco abuse, congestive heart failure, and poorly controlled diabetes with a dislocated femur. She has a moderately difficult airway and her oxygen saturation is 92% and is chronically on 2 liters of home oxygen. This patient would be high risk, not to mention that hip dislocations oftentimes require a deep level of sedation, so this patient would be better managed in the operating room under general anesthesia with the reduction performed by her consulting orthopedist. Next, you will want to assess how difficult your patients will be to innovate if for some reason the patient becomes apneic requiring you to take their airway. The American College of Surgeons Advanced Trauma and Life Support course has adopted the mnemonic LEMON, L-E-M-O-N, to stratify patients according to the risk of a difficult intubation, and I think it does a good job at helping the provider identify those with a difficult airway. L stands for look externally. Does the patient have lots of facial hair that will make a bag valve ventilation seal challenging? Do they have dentures, which will need to be taken out prior to intubation, or buck teeth that will make intubation hard? Does the patient have any abnormal facial anatomy, like a really narrow face, or a really short or fat neck? or facial trauma, which will cause for a more difficult intubation. E stands for evaluate, using the 3-3-2 rule. This rule describes three measurements found in the normal patients in which a difficult intubation is not expected. To assess the first three, have the patient lie flat on their back like we're about to intubate them, and ask them to open up their mouth as wide as possible. Ask them to place three of their own fingers in their mouth vertically. If they can do this, you know that they will be able to open up their airway adequately to insert the laryngoscope and attain a good view of the vocal cords. The second three provides an estimate of the volume of submandibular space. Have the patient place three of his fingers from the chin to the hyoid bone. This is their chin to neck distance. A normal patient will be able to place three fingers. So basically this tells you if you have enough room to push their tongue out of the way. And the two helps you to identify the location of the vocal cords relative to the base of the tongue. The patient should be able to fit two fingers from the superior thyroid cartilage to the neck junction. If the larynx is too high or anterior, in the neck, this makes for a harder visualization of the vocal cords. So three fingers in the mouth, three fingers under the chin, and two fingers at the top of the neck. M stands for mal empathy score. Have the patient open their mouth. Class one is the best and four is the worst. If you can see the soft palate, uvula, and tonsillar pillars, it's a one. But I think it's easier to remember that if you can see the uvula with the space in between the tongue, you are a class one. Class two is when you can only see half of the uvula. Class three is when you can only see a small portion of the uvula. Class 4 is when only the hard palate is visible. So in general, 1 and 2 will be easy, 3 will be difficult, and 4 will be extremely difficult. O stands for obstruction and obesity. Do they have a hoarse voice with fullness of their throat that could indicate a vocal cord cancer? Do they have strider, or can you see a large tonsillar abscess? N stands for neck mobility. Make sure they can lay supine and get in the sniffing position. Decreased mobility may be secondary to cervical degenerative disc disease, which will lead to a more difficult intubation. So quickly, to review, you can assess how difficult the patient will be to intubate using the mnemonic LEMON. L stands for look, E stands for evaluate using the 332 rule, M stands for mild and potty score, O stands for obstruction and obesity, and N stands for neck mobility. So now that we have taken a good past medical history focusing on comorbid conditions, determined the level of difficulty of managing their airway, identified their NPO status, and taken into account their ASA class, age, urgency of procedure, and how deeply they will need to be sedated. Make a decision if the patient is low risk and can have their procedure done safely in the emergency room or should they be taken to the operating room. Now that you have determined that the procedure can be done safely in the emergency room, let's continue to talk about how to prepare to sedate these patients. Well, before you even begin setting up your materials, getting everything ready, you need to go over the risk and benefits of procedural sedation with the patient and have them sign a consent form allowing for you to do the procedure. Have your nurse start an IV, put the patient on continuous cardiac monitoring, pulse oximetry, and serial blood pressure recordings. A couple minutes before the procedure even starts, even if the patient's oxygen saturations are good, you'll want to put them on high flow oxygen. 
place them on 15 liters with a non-rebreather. This is because if something was to go wrong during the procedure, you want to give them a higher reserve until you can improve their oxygenation, either with a bag valve mask or intubation. You'll also want to make sure that you put the patient on end tidal CO2 monitoring, which will measure the level of CO2 with each inspiration and exhalation, helping to better alert you the moment the patient becomes apneic. Now, I can't stress this enough, guys. Preparation is key. And the one time you aren't ready for the worst, it's going to happen. So you also need to gather all of your materials for a successful innovation and lay them out on the table or tray just in case. Attach your bag valve mask to high flow oxygen and place the bag valve mask over the patient, making sure it's the appropriate size for you to keep a good seal. You will also want to keep the oxygen on during the procedure. Make sure to have the rapid sequence innovation kit in the room just in case as well because the last thing you want to do is have someone frantically running out of the room to locate the kit. You don't have to put the defibrillation pads on the patient, but make sure the crash cart is readily available as well. Make sure to hook up your suction and make sure it's working. You should always have a backup plan as well in the event you cannot secure the airway with intubation. An LMA, nasogastric, or orogastric tube can be life-saving airway adjuncts. Now let's talk about the many different combination of drugs you can use for procedural sedation. Starting off with propofol, this medication is a phenol derivative that is highly lipophilic and therefore rapidly crosses the blood-brain barrier. This drug takes effects in approximately 40 seconds IV and lasts for about 6 minutes. The procedural sedation dose is 0.5 to 1 milligrams per kilogram IV. I'll say that again. The procedural sedation dose is 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram IV and can be followed by an additional dose of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IV every 3 to 5 minutes until the appropriate level of sedation is achieved. So in the typical 70 kilogram adult, that's an additional dose of 70 milligrams of propofol. So in my typical practice, I draw up the initial dose for the patient based off their weight. So in this example, once again, that'd be 70 milligrams. And then in a different syringe, I draw up an additional dose of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, or 35 milligrams in another syringe. I then draw up an additional dose of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram in the second syringe. So now that I have two syringes with 70 milligrams of propofol in each one, just in case the procedure takes longer than expected or they need additional doses of propofol of 35 milligrams every three to five minutes to achieve adequate sedation. You will also want to give this medication slowly, administering 20 milligrams every 10 seconds. So it should take about 35 seconds to administer 70 milligrams of propofol. If the patient reaches the desired level of sedation before 70 milligrams, you can stop there and begin the procedure. You will know that you have reached the desired level of sedation when the patient has a depressed level of consciousness and no longer is too concerned with what's going on around them. They should still be able to respond to verbal commands alone or light touch, and they should still be protecting their airway and ventilating on their own. Propofol is quick on in about 40 seconds and quick off in about 6 minutes, and it will provide you with good muscle relaxation. Oftentimes, they will wake up sooner within 2-3 to three minutes and will be wide awake. If you run into trouble, this is nice because chances are the patients will wake up quickly before anything bad happens. However, while propofol provides you with good sedative and amnestic effects, it provides no pain control. For this reason, you will commonly have to use additional medications such as fentanyl, ketamine, morphine, or hydromorphone to provide adequate pain control. But you should pick an agent carefully because the co-administration of opioids increases the likeliness of respiratory depression and complications. So I think a reasonable approach is in the event you're going to use propofol as your agent of choice is pre-treat the patient about 20 to 30 minutes prior to the procedure with morphine or your opioid of choice using the lowest effective dose to adequately control their pain. You can also argue that if they can't remember the procedure, they can't remember the pain. But I think it's cruel to not be adequately managing their pain and just make sure you're doing it safely. Other things to keep in mind is that patients over 55 are more sensitive to the effects of propofol, so you really need to reduce the dose by 20% or more in these patients and give the dose slower. Propofol can also cause respiratory depression, apnea, hypotension, and injection site pain. So this may not be the ideal medication in the patient who's already hypotensive, minimally hypoxic, or is clinically very dehydrated with dry oral mucous membranes and poor skin turgor notice prior to the procedure. Another medication that can be used is Atomidate. Atomidate is a sedative agent just like propofol and provides good muscle relaxation and amnestic effects. It has a rapid onset of action almost immediately after being given and a short duration of action of about 3 to 5 minutes with the patient waking up alert and orientated times 3. The initial dose is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram IV. I'll say that again. The initial dose is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram IV, and this is one-third the dose used for rapid sequence intubation. 
It can also be redosed every three to five minutes as well as needed. You will want to push the dose faster than propofol due to its rapid onset and short duration over about 30 seconds. Atomidate will generally provide you with more stable blood pressures and less respiratory depression when compared to propofol. Keep in mind higher doses will increase the respiratory side effects such as the full RSI dose of Atomidate, but generally Atomidate does not cause respiratory depression with a low dose of 0.1 mg per kilogram IV. However, you must be aware of the adverse side effects from Atomidate, which include dose-dependent adrenal suppression. So it's going to be harmful in septic patients or those suffering from multiple traumas, but really it's unlikely to be important in healthy patients. Other adverse side effects include injection site pain, nausea, and vomiting. But the most important side effect to be aware is myoclonus. This will present in the patient with a shaking or jerking of the extremities, and it's not a seizure. But many people can mistake it for one. The most severe form of myoclonus is a masseter spasm, which causes the jaw to clench shut. If this happens and does not spontaneously terminate quickly, then you will have to get paralytics and do a rapid sequence intubation. In addition, although reports of severe myoclonus are rare, in the event the patient is shaking and jerking without masseter involvement, you will need to provide immediate airway support and treat with 1 to 2 mg per said IV every 60 seconds until the myoclonus stops. Just like propofol, while Atomidate provides you with good sedative and amnestic effects, it provides no pain control. So for this reason, you will commonly have to use additional medications like fentanyl, morphine, hydromorphone to provide adequate pain control. But you should pick an agent carefully because the co-administration of opioids increases the likeliness of respiratory depression and complications. So it's reasonable to pre-treat your patients with your opioid of choice about 20 to 30 minutes prior to the procedure with morphine or another opioid using the lowest effective dose to adequately control their pain. If for whatever reason, ultra short acting agents like Atomidate and Propofol are unavailable, the combination of midazolam and fentanyl are sometimes used for procedural sedation. Now this is my least favorite option because titrating these medications to the right dose for the desired effect is difficult. Now, not to mention the increased risk of hypoxia, apnea, increased need for airway intervention, and medication reversals are higher when using these medications compared to our short acting sedative agents. For whatever reason, if you decide to use these medications, it is recommended to give midazolam first to decrease the risk of respiratory depression and then titrate fentanyl. However, administering fentanyl first and then midazolam is acceptable as well. Personally, I find it to be impractical to make the patient wait with their arm dislocated in severe pain until after the administration of midazolam to give fentanyl because it means your patient's just lying there in pain before the procedure. So if you decide to go with these drugs, I think a reasonable approach to this is treat the patient's pain initially with IV fentanyl. The initial dose is one microgram per kilogram. I'll say that again. The initial dose is one microgram per kilogram. So in your typical 70 kilogram adult, that would be a dose of 70 micrograms of fentanyl. Re-examine your patient to make sure they are comfortable before the administration of midazolam. If they are still in severe pain, you can administer another dose of fentanyl at 0.5 micrograms per kilogram, keeping in mind less is more. Once your patient is comfortable, go ahead and give midazolam. The initial procedural dose of midazolam is 0.02 milligrams per kilogram. I'll say that again. The initial dose, procedural dose of midazolam is 0.02 milligrams per kilogram with a maximal initial dose of 2 milligrams. So in your typical 70 kilogram adult, that'd be a starting dose of 1.4 milligrams. Wait about three minutes and observe the patient's response. If they have not achieved the level of adequate sedation required, go ahead and give another dose of 1.4 milligrams midazolam and wait three minutes again. Titrating up the dose can be challenging, and the right dose for one individual may vary greatly when compared to another individual of the exact same body size. As I mentioned before, this isn't my favorite choice. It increases the risk of hypoxia, apnea, airway interventions, and it also takes these patients substantially longer to wake up, sometimes even an hour, leaving these patients very drowsy and keeping the nursing staff tied up monitoring the patients until they're awake, alert, and orientated times three. Now, there's one more medication that we need to talk about and that's ketamine. Ketamine causes a type of dissociative sedation. It puts the patient in a trance-like state and provides sedation, pain control, amnesia, all while preserving the upper airway muscle tone, airway protective reflexes, and they're spontaneously breathing on their own. It's almost like the wonder drug. This is a type of dissociative sedation because the drug basically disconnects the patient's brain from their body. The patient enters a trance-like state, going off into la-la land. Ketamine has a rapid onset of action in the IV form within 30 to 60 seconds and provides you with about 20 to 30 minutes of sedation. Ketamine can also be given IM 
although its onset of action is slower at about 3 to 4 minutes and its duration of action is longer, lasting about 30 to 45 minutes. While the IV route is preferred, IM ketamine can be a good option in pediatric patients who are deathly afraid of needles. A quick shot in the butt, and within minutes you can gain IV access. The child will be staring at you without a care in the world as you gain IV access just in case something was to go wrong during the procedure and you should need it. Ketamine is dosed at 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram IV. I'll say that again. Ketamine is dosed at 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram IV in an adult, and it should be given slowly over about 1 to 2 minutes. Less is more, so in the typical 70 kilogram male, I would drop about 140 milligrams IV, and I would give my initial dose of 70 milligrams over about a minute, noting the response. You will know the patient is in the level of desired sedation when their eyes flicker and the patient's eyes get nystagmus. This is a normal reaction to ketamine, and it will resolve when the drug wears off. Other indicators that you have reached the desired level of sedation will be when the patient has a depressed level of consciousness and no longer is too concerned with what's going on around them. The brain is disconnected from their body, and they will oftentimes just give you a blank stare looking at you, but they don't really care what you're doing. They should still be able to respond to verbal commands alone or with light touch, and they should be protecting their airway and ventilating on their own. Since ketamine also provides good intrinsic pain management, it's not necessary to give additional pain medication with the administration of ketamine but you should be treating their pain adequately before you begin the reduction. Some adverse side effects of ketamine to be aware of include tachycardia, hypertension, laryngeospasm, emergence reactions, nausea and vomiting, hypersalivation, and increased intracranial and intraocular pressure. It is also cautioned in patients with underlying coronary artery disease. While the risk of increased intracranial pressure has basically been debunked, this topic is still controversial and we will not get into it today. In addition, hypersalivation can occur which can be reduced with the pretreatment of atropine, although I've never seen it to be of any clinical significance. Emergence reactions, however, are the most commonly reported side effect. These reactions typically occur most commonly in adults, up to 20% of the time, but they can occur in children too. You will know they are having an emergence reaction if when they are coming out of sedation they become agitated, are having frightening hallucinations, or profound disorientation. Some people like to pretreat with a small dose of midazolam, but it increases the risk of increased side effects. So I think a better option is that if an emergent reaction occurs, give a small dose of midazolam so they won't remember the side effect. However, while it's the most common side effect, I don't see it a lot. One of my attending physicians taught me this non-evidence-based approach, and I really think it works. While you're sedating the patient, especially the pediatric patient, I tell them to think about one of their favorite things. For example, about three weeks ago, I had a child who was deathly afraid of needles who suffered a laceration to the face. While he was being sedated with ketamine, he told me that he loved fishing, so I told him to think about catching the biggest fish he's ever caught or could imagine in the world. During the procedure, he had not a care in the world until about 10 minutes in, he saw his father's hair, and it resembled something like a catfish to him. He began petting his father's hair, saying, look, dad, I caught a catfish. It was quite enjoyable for everyone, and I will continue to use this method for this reason. About 4% of patients will have some nausea or vomiting when they wake up, and it can be easily treated with 4 milligrams of Zofran IV. Another possible, although rare, complication of ketamine is a laryngeospasm. If this occurs, it usually happens right after the administration of ketamine and can generally be stopped with some positive pressure inhalation via a bag valve mask. Nevertheless, if it doesn't terminate rapidly, be prepared to do a rapid sequence intubation. So as we talked about before, this is why it's so important to prepare all your materials so that they are readily available if the worst outcome should occur. Quickly, let's talk about how to manage the patient who becomes apneic or starts to desaturate during the procedure. As soon as you notice the patient becomes hypoxic or begins to desaturate, you need to stop what you're doing and do something about it. The initial step, and oftentimes all that's needed, is a little verbal or physical stimuli. Ask the patient how they're doing and tell them to take some deep breaths. If they're sedated a little bit deeper than you'd like and they aren't responding to verbal stimuli, give them a good sternal rub and awaken them up. If the patient is snoring, do a good jaw thrust maneuver. This brings the added benefit of some physical stimulus and should be done until the patient wakes up enough to protect his own airway as long as their saturations are improving and they're stable. If these techniques don't work, your next go-to maneuver is some positive pressure ventilation with the bag valve mask. Make sure to get a good seal on the patient and don't be afraid to have your attending physician squeeze the bag while you solely focus on a good seal. If all these techniques prove to be unsuccessful, you will need to secure their airway via intubation. While the need for intubation rarely occurs, this is why it's so important once again to have your RSI kit and all the other intubation tools readily available. So now we know how to effectively decide which patients can have the procedure safely done in the emergency room, how to properly prepare for procedural sedation, 
what medications to use and what side effects to look out for, and how to intervene if complications should occur. But let's talk about how to reduce anterior shoulder dislocations. Once again, as I mentioned in part one of this lecture, there's over 16 different ways to reduce anterior shoulder dislocations, so we're not going over each one today. But I think a reasonable approach is to use the method or methods in which you are most comfortable and trained in. This is because there's no clear evidence to support the superiority of any one method over the many that can be used. So once I have the patient to the desired level of sedation, my go-to initial approach is the traction counter-traction method. First, make sure the bed is locked and it's elevated to the hip crease of the person performing the reduction. Proper positioning is key and helps to ensure the proper application of force during a procedure. Have the patient sit up and wrap a bed sheet over the patient's upper chest, under the armpit of the dislocated shoulder, and underneath the back so the two ends of the sheets are of equal length and open to the unaffected side. Then tie a bed sheet around yourself. So if you're picturing this right now, you basically have what would be a hula hoop and you're inside of it with the patient's supine and his arm adducted or close to the body and flexed to 90 degrees, put his forearm inside your hula hoop bed sheet with the sheet just above the crease of the elbow. Place one hand just above the elbow and the other on the wrist and lean backwards slightly, letting your weight provide gentle traction on the arm away from the patient's body, while at the same time have your assistant gently pulling the bed sheet under the armpit to provide counter traction. If you don't get it at first, you can externally rotate the arm and abduct it until you feel the shoulder pop back into place. Now I'm going to say this and I'm probably going to jinx myself, but I've never not been able to reduce a shoulder with this method. So in the patient who has a successful reduction in the ED with sedation, you're going to want to gently and passively move the shoulder, ensuring its function and correct placement. Palpate their pulses one more time and make sure their sensation is normal as well over the axillary nerve. Then place them in a shoulder immobilizer immediately after the reduction and quick re-examination. This is because the most common complication of shoulder dislocation is a recurrent dislocation and nothing is more frustrating than to have a successful reduction and the shoulder only pops back out again in the ED and now you have to do the procedure again, maybe you even have to sedate them if they came out of sedation. Recurrent dislocations occur approximately in 50 to 90 percent of patients under the age of 20 and 5 to 10 percent of patients over the age of 40. You could argue that post-reduction films are not necessary. However, I find it to be common practice to confirm a successful reduction and exclude any fractures caused by the procedure with post-reduction films. Depending on the sedative used and the amount required, the time it takes until the patient is alert and orientated times three will vary greatly. The patient should be continuously monitored by a nurse and kept on oxygen, pulse oximetry, in tidal CO2, and continuous cardiac monitoring until they are alert and orientated times three and are able to sit up on their own. Once the patient is sitting up, you will need to reassess the patient. Feel their pulses once more and make sure their distal motor function is intact and their sensation is normal in their axillary nerve since right after the procedure, their sensation may be altered still from the sedative agent. Before discharging the patients, any symptoms of lightheadedness, pain, and nausea should be well controlled. The patient's mental status may be a little bit loopy, but do not send them home until it's returned to a point where the patient can take care of themselves with little or no assistance. They must have someone there who can drive them home and can supervise them for a couple of hours. I also like to make sure that the patient can walk in a straight line and tolerate oral fluids with the PO challenge. Make sure to tell the patient that it's not uncommon for the patients to experience mild symptoms of nausea, lightheadedness, fatigue, or unsteadiness for about 24 hours. Refer these patients to orthopedics within one week and educate them that they're going to be sore tomorrow and should ice the shoulder taking Tylenol and Motrin as needed. So that's everything we're going to talk about today. I hope this brought some clarity to the subject. As always, if you have any questions, please email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards. Until next time.